Today is going to be even better. Uh, we're going to focus on stroke for the good part of the day. We have a lineup of great speakers. And um, uh, the idea with this uh, conference is to try to keep uh, the lectures short to the point, uh, true updates. Um, and it's always a challenge to stay within time. So I'll do my best. I'm going to do two talks back to back uh, in order to make sure that uh, we're not late for Dr. Leiden. Um, who's going to give us a wonderful talk on hypothermia, something that uh, we've been uh, uh, really uh, active uh, about in this, in this hospital. So I just wanted to give you in the first uh, part of my talk an overview of uh, our program, um, a program that has been uh, now in the works for, uh, I would say, close to uh, 10 years. And uh, we've come uh, a long way, uh, and now we are truly sort of a group grown-ups, and, uh, and we are performing at, at uh, the highest level uh, that one can think of uh, when it comes to the care of stroke. And you will see why. It's, a, it, it's an impressive program. I, even I'm there day to day, week to week, and when I kind of looked at it um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, as we were presenting this to the surveyors, uh, I, I, I was I was impressed, and I, I hope that uh, you will leave with that uh, with that taste. And this is uh, the result of, of a teamwork. Uh, uh, stroke um, is truly a team uh, sport. Uh, we all there's a lot of parts to it, and I, I want to thank every one of you for being part of this. Um, now. Uh, I'm going to be very brief and go uh, on this slide, but basically this is to show you uh, the kind of uh, things that we're doing now. Um, some of this was just simply not conceivable a few years ago, just uh, uh, not a long, long time ago, in, in the sense that this is uh, you know, a patient that uh, has a stroke and uh, somebody recognizes that it's actually uh, a stroke. The first thing that, that has changed uh, and for us may be very obvious, but not, uh, was not obvious uh, as recent as 10 years ago, is that they are actually calling 911. But still, we need to do better than that. Uh, not, uh, it's about 40% or so of our ca uh, stroke cases are still coming uh, by some sort of private uh, transportation. Uh, but the thing I want to uh, outline is that this patient comes to our ER, and the process that is initiated is very fast. And at the end, uh, the times that we're seeing of door to needle are impressive. And this is an example of someone that received the drug 29 minutes after they entered this hospital. And this is the kind of numbers that we're seeing uh, more often now. <clears throat> now obviously, uh, before I move on, as I said, this is a team effort. And uh, this is uh, just pointing out uh, some of the uh, uh, you know, important characters in, 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 this, uh, in this movie. Um, the SMH Foundation um, has been of great uh, help sponsoring activities like this one. And obviously without the support of administration, we would not be here. Um, this is the reason why we do it. And I keep showing this slide year after year. The reason we do all this and we put all the, through all this trouble um, is because of disability, not because of mortality. The race is not against against mortality. The raising stroke is against disability. And every minute that goes by, that patient is just losing more neurons, more synapses, and just that reflects into more disability. So, and it continues to be the first cause of disability in this country and the second cause of disability among adults in the world. It, it, is, it is a big, big health, public health uh, problem. Um, in an oversimplified way, most of the uh, strokes are ischemic. There's a good chunk of them that are um, hemorrhagic nevertheless, but this is why we have focused, uh, one of the reasons we have focused so much on the ischemic side, and also obviously because about uh, uh, almost now tw 20 years ago, there's a drug that changes the natural history of an ischemic stroke. Uh, and it has been very difficult to change the behavior, but we definitely are making a, um, the big difference now. Time continues to be of essence, and continues to be of essence for the ischemic strokes, uh, because at, at every time there is a stroke, there's some degree of tissue that is at risk of dying if we don't improve things, if we don't improve the blood flow in that particular territory, that uh, is area that is uh, receiving not enough blood will eventually die. And so 
Um, this green area can be bigger or smaller depending on the stroke and the collateral flow that patients have, but what we want to avoid is this kind of uh, evolution so that we end up with a big stroke. We want to contain them uh, in sort of right here as fast as possible. And it is also true for, uh, for hemorrhage. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Seventy percent uh, of the hematomas expand over the first uh, 24 hours, and uh, most of that occurs in the first three to four hours. And so, if you add to that anticoagulation, uh, that risk of expanding is just worse. Now, the thing with hematomas is that mortality is almost linearly, or uh, not linear, it's actually more exponentially direct um, related to. Uh, to the size of uh, or the volume of the hemorrhage. So we want to contain hemorrhages um, uh, as much as we can and avoid this kind of uh, evolution. So not only ischemic strokes, uh, not only in ischemic strokes time is essential, but also in hemorrhagic strokes. And the truth ha um, is also uh, for subarachnoid hemorrhages. Uh, we need to act very quickly because um, not only uh, it's a devastating event. Uh, when it happens, the chances of dying is a good 20, 30 percent when that initial bleed occurs. But the problem is the rebleeding, and that rebleeding can occur also within the first day very fast. And if that happens, then your chances uh, of making it are even uh, slimmer. So we need to act fast. So let's go back to ischemic strokes, and I keep bringing this statistic because is that is that simple and is that impressive and but and. People say, well, it's not a big thing, but it, it is a big deal. Uh, th um, this is definitely, definitely better than doing nothing. That, that, that was exactly what we were doing for, for decades. And um, this is a drug that, for the first time, is changing the natural history of a stroke that is in evolution, of an ischemic stroke that is in evolution. And patients that receive this drug is that simple. If you receive the drug, you have a 30% better chance of walking out of the hospital with minimal to no disability. Uh, and this statistic continues to be very consistent, study after study, no matter if it's in Australia, in the Europe, in Asia, in South America. Um, this is another um, graph that very clearly depicts that time is of, of essence. And um, this uh, summarizes uh, the chances of, um, of improving um, if you receive thrombolytics. Um, and what you see here, uh, on this uh, axis is the time, and these are the, uh, the odds ratio. So if you are to receive the drug within 90 minutes after the onset of the symptom, your chances of improving are definitely much higher than if you receive it at three hours. And that, those chances start sort of tapering off until at least statistically you start losing that benefit at around four and a half hours. Then at that point, uh, the benefit is not so great and the, and the complications rates start taking over. Uh, those complications mainly uh, hemorrhage. And if not hemorrhage, at least the benefit is not there. By then it's too late, the, the ischemic stroke is set in, and given the thrombolytics, it's not gonna make much of a difference. But, but this, this, this graph, this progression is, is key. So we want to kind of be more towards the left of that graph. And it has been a challenge. The drug was approved, uh, uh, Alteplase was approved in 1996 uh, based on a study that uh, used the drug up to three hours. And that has been sort of the standard of care, zero, zero to three hours. Back then, it, 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 it was amazing to the all sorts of comments of people, it's impossible to do, it's very difficult. And nowadays, uh, you will see the kind of numbers that, that we are getting. Um, so, uh, Get With the Guidelines is a national registry um, that uh, a, supports and, and monitors sort of quality improvement. And it, <clears throat> talk about big numbers. Here we are, this is a review of 58,000 uh, patients that, have, that are part of the Get With the Guidelines, have received TPA. And there's actually a follow-up to this study, uh, including uh, actually bigger numbers, uh, over 70,000. And the statistics are very uh, similar. So for every 15 minutes that we do our process uh, faster, the patients actually benefit. And they benefit sort of at, at this uh, order of magnitude. 4% 4, 4 decrease in the chances of mortality or bleeding. 4% increase in the chances of independent ambulation at discharge. Um, and similarly, um, three, four percent increased chance of being discharged home. Uh, no need to, uh, you know, long uh, periods of, of rehab. So those are impressive results because if you were to then oversimplify this, this means that for every 30 minutes that we can do this process faster, those chances 
are one in ten of, of actually doing better. And that's that's pretty good uh, odds. Now this takes uh, obviously a well choreographed uh, uh, process. That, that that is what programs like ours do. And so we meet on a weekly basis, and we try to to make sure that we go over the whole process and see where the problems are, where the obstacles are, and how can we improve them and speed them up so that in the end uh, we can give the drug faster. And that's what we have been doing uh, for the past 10 years, basically. Um, so that patients recognize the signs, so that EMS dispatch recognizes that is a stroke, dispatches um, uh, the, um, uh, the personnel uh, fast, they give uh, the <laughs> ER uh, heads up, the ER prepares, and receives the patients. Um, and little things such as um, not rooming the patient, but receiving the patient uh, right there where um, at, at the ambulance bay, and then from there making the decision whether they go to Cascan or not, that saves two, three minutes or more. That makes a big difference. Um, and all of those things uh, are uh, the kind of uh, things that we review in the process and, and have made a difference in our times. Um, so that at the end, we, we can offer these patients um, the appropriate um, uh, therapeutic options. Now, this is uh, uh, sort of the key, um, summarizes the key players in our uh, stroke uh, team response. Uh, it goes from the ER physicians and nurses uh, to registration um, to the rapid response team that has uh, been key in all this. They kind of make sure that all along the way, uh, everything conti is, is continuing uh, in the smoothest ways possible, and there's no, um, you know, hiccups and, and, and obstacles that um, that nobody kind of is is seeing and trying to fix. Um, laboratory uh, is is part of, of the res of the response team initially, so all these members of the team uh, receive a pager right away when there's a stroke alert, and everyone gets ready. And then um, as the ear physician gives the go, then everyone comes into action, meets there, and uh, it, takes, it takes off from there. Now, so what happens is that, um, as you can imagine, <clears throat> a patient comes to the ER at this point in time zero, and then all the series of events have to happen. And the goal is for them to happen within an hour. And this was a big challenge, and we have been working on this hour now for four years, and it was very difficult to, to try to, to break that, uh, that threshold. Um, so we have developed, we tried many things. Uh, I think one of the biggest uh, uh, um, um, things that made a, a difference in that process was that we were able to then capture 100% of the data so that we could look at where the problems were. Um, and that made a, a huge difference. Um, in, um, in improving the process and uh, developing tools like this one. Uh, so we monitor every type of activity, we, we time, uh, we, we follow their times so that we know where the process may be, where the process was in, uh, in sending the patient from, to the cask or where the process was in, order, in ordering uh, labs, for instance, or the delivery uh, of the TPA from the pharmacy. So that way, as we partition the whole process, we can have a better understanding of what the problem may be. So that at the end, the big number we're looking is what is our door to needle time, okay? Now let's look at the program um, um, in, in, in numbers. Um, this is a, a summary of what has happened in the last um, three years. And our volumes of uh, ischemic stroke have uh, risen and now we are uh, over 508, uh, over 500 uh, cases per year. Interestingly, um, our numbers for uh, uh, intracranial hemorrhages and sobriety have remained relatively flat. Um, but we'll continue to monitor that. I, I don't quite understand why, why that is the case. Um, in general, we take care of two thirds, no, three fourths of our patients are really are from Sarasota County, but we do see a fair amount of patients from uh, other counties. Um, this is uh, something to point out. Our population um, is uh, obviously uh, quite advanced in, in age. Um, this is a challenge. This means these patients have obviously more comorbidities, have uh, sometimes uh, not as good collaterals um, as younger population, uh, bigger strokes. And despite of that, our results uh, are quite impressive. So keep that in mind. Um, our mean uh, age on the TPA case is about 75 years. 
Now this is what has happened in terms of uh, TPA rates. We started the program in 2004, and uh, before that uh, there was nearly no TPA uh, use, or very little, and this is, bear in mind that the drug was approved in 1996. Uh, <clears throat> shortly after the program started, uh, we were already above the national average. These gray bars are the Medicare uh, rates for TPA use um, in the nation. And uh, we have uh, risen to maintain our rates around 10 to uh, 13%. And uh, now that in, we have new trials that incorporate also the use of intraarterial uh, therapy, um, I think that these numbers will probably go even higher. But the, the point to make is that our rates of TPA are roughly 12 to 14%. This is the, the we're using as the denominator all ischemic strokes, all right? This is not just the, the ones that come uh, within that narrow window of, of, say, three, four hours. This is all ischemic strokes. So it's a little bit uh, unfair. If we were to uh, only use those patients that come uh, in that very narrow uh, time window, uh, our rates are, are much higher. You will see that in a moment. But um, the other thing is uh, we have now been certified as primary stroke centers for five times, and uh, today, obviously, we just had the announcement of, the, of being a certified as comprehensive stroke centers. And what that means is that a comprehensive stroke center like us, we provide expertise, uh, comprehensive care, uh, optimize care, minimize complications, and improve outcomes. And how do we improve outcomes? Well, this is a summary we have t uh, of the cases that we have uh, given TPA intravenously in, in our institution since the um, inception of the program. So in, 2000 and in 2004 through December of last year, we have TPA in nearly 360 patients. Uh, our uh, mean NIH, which is a scale of severity of stroke, uh, was 15, and these are two large uh, uh, trials that give you a sort of a comparison. The higher the number, the more severe the stroke. So 15 is a moderately severe uh, stroke. Um, the, our mortality, despite of the age group, is no different than what is expected or has been reported. So it remains uh, right uh, at the national average uh, and what has been reported in studies. And more importantly, uh, the big question was, are we doing harm uh, because our population is uh, older? Is this drug really safe? And after 360 patients, we continue to show that we are below what has been reported and expected as hemorrhagic complications. This, uh, we are 5%. And 75% of our patients either go to inpatient rehabilitation or go home. 52% of them actually go home. This is the big summary uh, slide, which uh, has, is the result of a lot, a lot of work over the last uh, few years. And in 2011, uh, 2012, we tried very hard to, uh, we started working on, uh, on trying to, to beat that zero to 60 uh, minute time. And uh, finally, we were able to start capturing 100% of the data. And that uh, gave us a better understanding of what the problems were. We started changing the process, improving, and we have gained significantly over that. And now our uh, median times uh, is, um, runs around 52. This is uh, last year, 54. We continue to kind of bring that down slowly. This is another big summary slide that um, shows, and the, the green bars are showing that if someone arrives to our ER within two hours of the onset of their strokes, 100% of them, as long as they meet the criteria, obviously they will receive the TPA. Uh, that was not the case a few years ago, and it continues to be 100%. So. Uh, that's very reassuring. And uh, the blue bars are showing the percentage of people that are receiving the drug under 60 minutes. And we have uh, made tremendous gains. Uh, and the, 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 the biggest change was in 2013 when we, uh, as I said before, implemented uh, gathering of data um, and understanding exactly what the problems were. And we're holding this 80% pretty uh, solidly. Um, another way of looking at it is, um, in, in this slide I, I want to show two things. One is that our um, volume has increased uh, nearly 50% in comparison to, to the pr pr previous years. 2014 we TPA uh, nearly 60 patients. And the other point I want to make is not only are 80% of our patients receiving a TPA under 60 minutes, but now we are uh, off 40% of our patients and, and improving uh, are receiving the drug under 45 minutes. We uh, carefully follow all, uh, a lot of um, um, 
quality imp um, improvement measures um, such as uh, you know we monitor patients making sure that uh, uh, they receive uh, the antithrombotics when they are on discharge, discharge these uh, receive uh, uh, statins uh, stroke education etc and believe me this bar did not look that good a few years ago uh, but this is sort of what we had are now used to to see this kind of, uh, of statistics and as a result of that we have been uh, uh, recognized by the American Heart uh, uh, Association um, as a, a quality uh, stroke center, and we have received all these uh, different distinctions. And the, the most recent uh, being part of the target elite uh, because our door to needle times, and now the DMV Comprehensive Stroke Center certification. Um, I wanted to say just one thing that uh, we have now, we're now using Telestroke for those that are not uh, aware, and um, this is used mainly. Uh, uh, between the main campus and the satellite uh, ER in Northport, but we also have it here uh, in the main campus uh, to use uh, from our uh, homes uh, or wherever we are if we need to take care of, of patients. And uh, we're now starting to uh, offer this service with the Soto Memorial Hospital as well. So now, not only we improve outcomes, but uh, we also widen the spectrum of uh, treatment options. And uh, by that I mean that we go beyond IV TPA. Um, so now Dr. Case has joined us for the last two and a half years and he's becoming busier and busier. Uh, the kind of things that he does is that he will go with catheters up uh, into the brain and try to uh, open this uh, uh, clots when uh, IV TPA uh, does not work as well. Uh, he can also use uh, whole sorts of uh, tools and catheters to try to extract the clot and uh, he works uh, very closely with neurosurgeons uh, to uh, you know, help uh, decide which patients will uh, be better served by uh, coiling the, uh, the, uh, the aneurysms rather than you know, having a craniectomy and clipping their aneurysms. Uh, this is an example of what's happening now in our center. Uh, this patient uh, is a 77 year old that had a left hemiparesis and um, uh, was immediately taken to CTA, uh, CTCTA, and he was found to have an occlusion here. Now we didn't wait um, uh, to TPA to uh, work or not. We just started uh, IV TPA and our door to needle time was 41 minutes, uh, but immediately he was taken to uh, uh, to the um, angio suite. So as they were sort of working in parallel, making the decision and getting the angio uh, team together, TPA was started, and uh, actually was still uh, being infused while the Dr. Case was uh, doing the case. Um, and in fact, the door to growing time was actually uh, for 59 minutes. Um, and so this patient uh, ended up uh, with an open artery and uh, with an NIH of five. Uh, at 24 hours, uh, which is uh, a big improvement from an initial NIH uh, in the uh, mid-20s. A word on hemorrhage, uh, obviously they, are, they come in different uh, ways, um, and we are now focusing a lot on uh, also sort of the, the, the time uh, component of uh, hemorrhagic uh, management, and the reason is this, is because also it's kind of a dynamic process. As I mentioned earlier, these hemorrhages tend to grow, so we want to act quickly, particularly in the patients that have uh, anticoagulation, and um, the reason is because all that process is just augmented, what I just showed you. And what I mentioned earlier is that mortality, in a very simple terms, mortality is, is related to the size or the volume of, of uh, uh, of that hemorrhage, so we want to contain the hemorrhage as small as possible. So <clears throat> now we have been using for some time products like uh, the PCCs, the prothrombin complex concentrates, um, so that um, we can try to stop the effects of uh, Coumadin, um, the anticoagulation effects of Coumadin as fast as possible. And we're now shooting for, uh, or monitor very carefully the door to needle times or, uh, for the use of procoagulant so that uh, we can hopefully improve uh, the outcomes of these patients as well. And uh, not only uh, we have uh, offer a wider spectrum of treatment options, but we contribute to research. It's something that I think is important. Uh, I think that uh, it's part of a, uh, the duty of a hospital of, of this uh, caliber. Um, and this is just examples of the, the different trials that uh, we are part of. Um, and uh, we will continue to, uh, uh, to push in that direction. Um, in interest of time, 
I'm going very fast here, but uh, the other th um, aspect that I want to touch on is uh, this, uh, this last uh, point here, which is that um, we have, we're now focusing much more on the, on the education on the, and, and on the prevention side above, uh, once, you know, outside the doors of this hospital. I think that that is one of the uh, sort of uh, uh, duties of, of a program like this. And w when you think about that, um, what we have done so far is we have focused a lot on the front end of the problem. When the patient comes with a stroke, we are focused on the first 24 hours and sort of this is, this bars, uh, what I try to give here was sort of a relative uh, weight to our focus uh, in the last few years, which is very heavy on the first 24 hours, making sure that that we do uh, this process fast, that we can put the fire out as quickly as possible, and obviously improving uh, all the quality care in the hospital. And then they go to inpatient rehab, and we do some activity in secondary prevention, but it then becomes um, more diluted because now they go to different neurologists and outpatient. We don't have much of a control of it. And then, you know, yep, yeah, well, we're done. We put the numbers where we want and, and we just keep repeating time and again, lose weight and eat well and healthy st uh, lifestyle. That really happens very little. And uh, it, it is very frustrating as, as a uh, clinician uh, to kind of be repeating the same thing over and over again and not seeing this uh, needle move at all. And, as a clinician, I don't have the time. Uh, the, 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 the things are such that I, I cannot devote much quality time to explain why this is important, give the fact, et cetera. So um, the reality, though, is that for the patient, this process, what we, for us, was takes half of this bar. For the patient, is, is relatively less. Because once he's done with this, he has 10, 5, 10, 15 years left with this history of a stroke and that sort of risk hanging over him. And, and so this is more the reality and the patient's per, uh, perception too. So that's why uh, without uh, uh, losing the attention and the quality of work that we're doing on the front end, I, I want to pay more attention sort of to this end of, of, of the spectrum of the stroke care um, as a program director. and and as the program is uh, at all, uh, uh, as a whole. And so I'm calling this sort of a post-stroke wellness program. And it's also taking advantage of all the wonderful things that this uh, hospital has to offer. Um, so just in, in, in summary, we, we have developed this uh, TIN stroke prevention clinic, uh, basically with the focus, uh, with two objectives. One is to, to make this the, the place where every patient that is discharged goes there as, as part of the transition uh, care into outpatient care where they are going basically to receive education and, and, and have their uh, questions answered. And where this uh, patients with TIAs can be seen rapidly um, if um, uh, the ER is not available, if they cannot be the, um, admitted, or if the ER sees them but uh, discharge them and wants uh, them to follow within 48 hours, uh, this is the place to follow. Um, in the busy practices, primary physicians or specialists will not necessarily have an opening uh, that fast. So that in a nutshell is what we're doing. And, and uh, to me, this is sort of the, the, the next big thing in our program. Um, taking advantage of our HealthPlex Center, of our wonderful uh, rehab uh, staff, and um, a program that already has started. Uh, we're now really beefing up and, and focusing a lot on the support uh, uh, side of, um, of, of uh, for patients once they have their strokes and they're done with everything inpatient, outpatient uh, uh, rehabilitation. So we have created uh, this program uh, that stands that has sort of four pillars. One is a stroke. Re um, what we call uh, uh, stroke recovery, which is for those patients that still have some disability and want uh, some uh, periodic uh, or need periodic uh, outpatient specialized rehab, um, be part and parcel of a fitness program. Um, and we also have uh, su the support group that focuses on education. We have conferences every month for education on different topics that we seldom we talk, have time to talk in our offices or here. Um, and then uh, a big component of it is nutrition. And uh, what we want is for p patients to really uh, uh, be part of one of these four, one or more of these columns, and then uh, start sort of engaging them in participating more in athletic activities, recreational activities, so that they move. And the, the whole idea is to, for, to have them sort of move the needle towards a healthier lifestyle. So that's our big focus now. 
<laughs> so in essence, uh, um, this is who we are, our regional leader in stroke care, and a program that focuses in prevention and education for our community.